Okay, so I'm here today with uh, Larry Hattenberg, who is a veteran video journalist uh, from Wichita, and we have questions from students. Sure. Um, Larry, the first question is about video production. So they're asking, did you film and edit the video that we saw? Did you do that all yourself? And if so, what does that process look like? Yes, I did uh, edit that video that you saw. Uh, it's it's a, what I would call a simple edit. I have an editing uh, system in my house uh, made by a company called Avid. Uh, Avid is a, is a nonlinear editor. editor. And uh, many motion picture makers use Avid as their editing machine. It's what I used to produce and still produce the Hatterberg's People series on for television. So yes, I, I did use that. It's just easy for me to use to produce something that's just not me standing here. I'm pretty boring if I'm just standing here talking to somebody. But if you can add graphics to it and add video to it, I think it, it makes it much more interesting for the listener. Yeah, and viewer, right. right. And I think during this during this time of the pandemic, we're all trying to figure out how to make our videos more interesting, how to make our teaching more interesting, and and so that's a yeah, sure. Um, is you know, and you talked about your your history of of your life and everything. This question asks: Is there something you'd like to change from the past, and what would what would that be? Would there be something you'd do differently? <laughs> Well, yeah, I think if you have your life to live over again, you would always do something differently. Um, although I have to tell you, I, I spent 51 years at Cake TV and I, and I really loved 90% of my career. 10% uh, of it, you know, because of certain stories that you cover like BTK or, or other stories that are not fun that are kind of evil type stories. Those were not a lot of fun to cover, but for the most part, over that 51 years, I would I would do it all again. Um, and I remember when I first started at Cake TV, uh, I was having such a good time. They never told me my hours. So I would get there at like seven o'clock in the morning and leave after the 10 o'clock newscast late at night. That was back in 1963. And I never asked what my hours were when I first started because it was just fun. So in terms of the job itself, um, I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't change a whole lot. Um, the other thing that I learned over the course of time is you have to keep re-educating yourself as you're doing the job because the technology changes all the time, and in television it changes like every half hour. It seems like uh, I started in the days when it was black and white silent film. And we went from black and white to color to color film with a magnetic stripe so you could record sound on the side and then to videotape analog and then finally to digital files like we record today and you have to keep learning and there were a lot of people in the business who i entered with who decided to leave because a they didn't they liked film they didn't want to learn videotape or digital technology and I think that's just a death knell for your career when you do that. So I would encourage anybody if you're out there and, and uh, whatever business you're in, just keep abreast of the technology, keep learning because you leave Bethel doesn't mean that your education ends. Your education is just really starting and it, it continues every day and you just have to keep up with the new things. Yeah, as an educator, I appreciate that. And as an educator, I appreciate when you said Think of everyone you meet as a teacher with something yeah. to teach you. Um, exactly. Here's a here's a question, and I've talked to people about uh, this presentation this week, and uh -huh. many many people remember the story about the man who lived in a hole. And yes. something about that story that's just very striking and memorable. So this this uh, this question asks, how do you how did you choose uh, the people that you profile in your series? How did you make the selection of those people? And then how did you come about finding this man who lived in a hole? How did that happen? Sure. Well, the selection process was fairly easy. Um, while I was at Cake TV, we subscribed to all the small town newspapers. And I would find stories in these little small town newspapers that maybe were just an inch or two in length in their paper, but I felt had a deeper meaning that I thought I could make them into a really interesting television story because of who the person was, not because of anything I did, but because of who the person was. I felt they had a great story to tell. 
And then as the Hatterbergs People series progressed over the course of time, every time I put one story on the air, we get tons of letters and email from other people saying, hey, you ought to come over to my hometown. I've got this guy or I've got this woman who's been around the town and boy, you know, then they would tell me about that person and what makes that person special. So after a while, it wasn't a hard selection process. Well, the only hard selection process uh, because we were getting so much mail during the, the height of the uh, Hatterberg's People series that it, it was hard to, to choose just one. I mean, we could have done a story on every newscast, a separate story. Um, and as to Ernie Dittimore, the man who lived in a hole in the ground, that was referred to me by a reporter at the Topeka Capital Journal newspaper. He called me up one day. I worked with him a lot. And he said, hey, Larry, I got this story about this guy in Donovan County. Why don't you do the story on it? And he told me a little bit about the guy. And I said, sounds like a great story. Why don't you do the story? And he said, well, I tried. <laughs> and he threw me off his land. <laughs> well, it, you know, when, when there's the opportunity to be thrown off someone's land, you kind of think twice about the story. But the story was so intriguing to me when he told me that I thought, I'm just going to go up there. And I, as you know, if when you saw the story, you couldn't give him a call, couldn't write him a letter, no way to tell him you're coming. So I just kind of showed up. And he and I hit it off, not necessarily right at first in the first 20 minutes, but over the course of the day, he and I hit it off. We had a good time together. And by the time we were through taping the story, I didn't want to leave. Had to, but I didn't want to leave. And the reason was I was learning a lot from this old guy who lived in a hole in the ground who hadn't bathed for 25 years. He was very different than anybody I had ever met before and, uh, or since. But I was just learning from him. And just being around him was really what I consider a gift uh, because of who he was, how he felt about life. And as I said, told everybody in the story of all the stories I've done over 51 years, he is the happiest and most content person I've ever done a story on. I mean, I know you're happy and I'm happy, but can we really say we're content you know, I, I, you always want that new iPhone or that new car or that new camera, or that new computer. Ernie didn't. He had the sunrise and the sunset. And for him, that's all he needed. I love that story. So you mentioned about uh, small town newspapers and reading them. It's a question that asks, what gives you hope for the future of local journalism? Uh, that's a sore point, really. Uh, I'm depressed about local journalism, particularly, particularly the small town newspapers. Uh, it is those newspapers that really hold a small town together, much like the school system in the town. If the school system is consolidated and is gone, town sense to, tends to start to fall apart. Same way when you lose your newspaper. The town has no cohesive unit to it anymore because the newspaper's gone. And I'm worried about that in Kansas and every other state in the union. Um, as you well know, uh, so many newspapers across the state here in this state uh, are no longer existing. And so many of them that do exist have been pared down to where their reporting staff is almost non-existent. I think that's a terrible, terrible, terrible trend. And I'm not smart enough to know how to reverse it. Um, I, we know that online is, is the future probably for newspapers. Um, I take my Wichita Eagle now online. I take the New York Times online, Wall Street Journal online, Washington Post online. So that obviously is the future. But for these small town newspapers that don't have the pull of those larger newspapers, I'm not sure how they do it. And I'm not sure what the future holds. I know that there are many who are looking into it, and many people much smarter than I am. And I hope they do find a solution, but it's, it's devastating, I think, to a small town when that newspaper dries up. Um, thinking back in your career, is there a particular interview subject you wish you could speak with again, somebody you could go back to and, and uh, catch up? 
Well, Ernie, Ed, Ernie Didimore was one of those that we just talked about. He was uh, by far one of the most striking people I've ever done a story on. And, you know, I always said my favorite story was the last story that I did. And that's, and that's really true. Um, there's, uh, there's a couple thousand stories really in the Hatterberg's People series. And uh, I've, I just loved all of them. I, I just had such a good time with the person in most cases. I will tell you, I had uh, twice, uh, I killed a story when I actually got out on the scene because the person wasn't who they said they were. And my research prior to meeting them didn't pull that out. And so that was my fault. Uh, but most all of this, the people who I've met along the way, I've really enjoyed working with them. Um, I remember one story, and we were just talking about small town newspapers in Protection, Kansas. Uh, the gentleman who was the editor of the little Protection, Kansas newspaper, he was wonderful. He was born to be a reporter and he loved that town. And he'd, he'd go over to the local cafe and he'd take his notes and write his story on napkins from the local cafe. And I just loved that. His, his assistant showed me this drawer <laughs> in his desk and it's just full of napkins that are all written and scribbled on, but that's how he got his stories. And he was, he was just a great guy. And he typed all of his stories on manual typewriter. He had five of them. These were old typewriters like I used to use in Winfield High School back in the 60s, early 60s. And uh, he didn't want to do, have anything to do with the computer. He just loved the newspaper business and the people loved him. And I would talk to the low, we'd be in the cafe where he'd be writing this stuff down and people would come in and they would chat with him like he was their brother, like he was their son. And uh, he was just a joy to be around. And I, you just, I smile every time I think of that. He's no longer with us. He was uh, probably 85 when I did that story. He was just one of the old time newspaper editors. Loved him to death. And uh, those are the kind of people who should be on television, you know, people who have a story, people who make a difference in other people's lives. Yeah. And uh, I loved him and, and all of the other Hatterbergs people I did. I liked them all. Okay. And finally, this, uh, this is not a question. This is from a student who, say, who says, I just wanted to thank you for your words of wisdom at the end of your presentation. They definitely sat well with me and made me deeply reflect. And I appreciate your words at the end too. And so is there thank you. anything else you'd like us to think about in, in parting today? Well, I, I think the most important thing, particularly on this day and what every American has been going through in the past few months, um, is to cherish each individual and to keep a very open mind on every person you meet. Um, I'm, I'm tired of hearing people call each other names. I don't like that. Uh, it doesn't move us forward as a society. It doesn't move us forward as an individual. Uh, so I don't, I don't like that at all. We have to start listening and we have to start understanding and we have to start figuring out the problems together. We can't have this group over here on this side yelling and screaming and another group over here yelling and screaming. We have to get together bring our voices down and settle things in a humane, normal, educated way. Uh, that has to be the future. And, uh, but it, just treating each other with respect. You know, I, I think we're missing that a lot. Uh, I see that in my life as I go around now and I still do the Hatterberg's People series and still do other stories. And I get into situations sometimes in which people are just nasty just nasty to each other and there's no real need for that we don't we're not building ourselves up we're not building each other up by being detrimental to each other and and it's just a problem in this country now and i know you see it in education and we see it in in every aspect of our life it has to stop it has to change 
you know, otherwise this country is just going to be mired in, in disaster in the future. And I love this country and I want to see the best for this country. But we all have to change and we all have to change our outlook. So I guess I would tell people be understanding, be open, and believe in America. Wonderful charge for our students. I appreciate that. Sure. I appreciate the time you've taken to, to spend with us and um, good luck in the future. We're going to keep watching Hanover's people and, and uh, seeing what, what the story comes next. Well, thank, thank you. you. We'll, uh, we'll keep it going. And, uh, Maybe sometime we can meet the students in person. That'd be great. Okay. Okay. 